Welcome to another episode of the World Metal Congress webcast. Lena, what a pleasure it is to see you. How are you doing? I am doing very well, thank you. Good. Well, a, a delight to have you back. And uh, beaming in from Beirut, um, you know, uh, as ever, you know, World Metal Congress is an international organization. But what we're talking about today is not so much about the global impact of this music, but more an issue that affects everybody in this community globally, the issue of mental health. And we have two tremendous guests joining us. Tell us a little bit about who's joining us today. Well, we're joined by Jesse from Killswitch Engage, uh, who is one of the most vocal people, and rightly so, about the importance of talking about mental health. And he's also uh, a very generous person in sharing his personal experiences. Um, in this regard uh, with fans and other musicians. So it'd be really great to hear from him about his firsthand experience. And also we have Dr. Katie Quinn, who is a psychologist and who also uh, runs a community support initiative called Heavy Metal Therapy. Absolutely brilliant introduction and uh, a hugely important subject. I can't wait to bring them aboard because this is an issue that isn't talked about enough. It's not an issue of mental health. We all know that that has to be addressed. It's really more an issue of destigmatization. And so without further ado, we're gonna bring Kate and Jesse in. Jesse and Kate, what an absolute pleasure it is to welcome you to World Metal Congress. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> good. Well, um, look, good to have you aboard. Yeah, really good, thank you. Good, 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 good. Um, Look, it's a pleasure to have you here. And, and the subject we're talking about today, I suppose, is, you know, uh, multifaceted. Um, it is as much about the subject as it is your own experiences as, as well. Um, Kate, I, I guess I wanted to begin with you with a really broad question. Is mental health still stigmatized? What has the journey been over the last few years? How has our perspective on it changed? And what work remains to be done? Um, that's a great question, and I could probably spend an hour <laughs> talking about that on its own. But um, I'll just try to be try to be brief. I think there is still stigma out there, and I think that probably um, particular certain particularly certain kinds of mental health experiences there is do still carry some some stigma. Um, you could argue that we're more aware of mental health than we ever have ever have been. I think particularly since the COVID pandemic, it's been something that we've discussed loads about, you know, mental health is very important. Um, I sometimes worry about the difference between awareness and knowing about something and then what we do afterwards, if that makes sense. And those two things I think have got to match up. That for me is where the work is still, because um, we are seeing massively increased demand in um, terms of people experiencing mental distress. Um, yeah. Uh, also, you know, th th there might not be the, the services and things like that out there. So I think there's definitely a lot to, there's a lot to do. Um, I would argue that maybe there is, um, I hope, I, I think actually less men mental health stigma in the metal community than there maybe are in other parts of society, which I guess is probably part of what we might talk about. Indeed. Well, uh, I think we definitely want to, you know, investigate and hear about all the work that you're doing and so on, but um, but also, yeah, uh, turn to Jesse, because of course, you know, just like as a prominent musician, you know, um, you know, as a person, as part of this community, you've been very outspoken about, you know, the issues, but also your own experiences around it all. And so, so I wondered, what was the reaction like when you first began giving interviews and talking about what your experience of anxiety was, um, what the experience of mental health challenges in your own family were, um, were you surprised or encouraged or, or disappointed by the reaction? Um, I think all, all of the above for me, um, you know, when I first started to speak about it years ago, there was a bit of the, you know, um, posturing and sort of backlash from people who were basically telling me to, to shut up and suck it up and get over it. Um, that was still very much a part of the dialogue. Uh, and some of it was difficult to navigate, but, you know, the few people that I was reaching uh, really made it sort of solidified the fact that I needed to do this, uh, not just for myself, but for my fans and for people who were paying attention. But I'm happy to say over the years, and especially this past year, as she just touched upon, which I thought was 
brilliant what she said about the work that still needs to be done um, is a lot of my discussions, I'd say 90% of my discussions now uh, through social media, through various apps is strictly about mental health. I've legitimately become a sounding board for people and it's been interesting and rewarding for sure, but also like, wow, I mean, I went from being a singer at a band that wrote lyrics and people were able to relate to, to sort of being, you know, that people are coming to me with their issues and it's, it's this year, especially has been really hard, but I have been able to give some advice and what I have been giving the advice I've been giving is not just about the fact that we need to talk about it, but being active about it, changing your lifestyle, your diet, getting more exercise, all these things that really do help in the process of, of sort of getting more in touch with uh, sharpening your tools, I guess would be the word I would use to, to help deal and to cope with these issues. So it's been a huge learning experience. And my journey from start to where I am now has been completely eye opening and it's really empowered me a lot. I've gotten so much more control over my own issues that I've been able to turn around and help other people. But it's all because of the journey and the stigma is still there, but it's definitely starting to unravel and people are a lot more willing to share. And some of the tough guys that used to make fun of me are now the ones sending me tearful messages, thanking me for being the person that they thought was this tough guy. And I was like, I'm not, I'm a regular guy that has these things and we all have them. And so it's been a total blessing, but it hasn't been easy the whole way through for sure. And we still do have a lot of work to do. Um, Jesse, if I may follow up, um, obviously one of the contradictions that we're going to talk about today is how, on the one hand, the metal community uh, is a place where now, at least, it's becoming more and more uh, common to uh, talk about uh, mental health issues, and um, I think this is a good thing. But at the same time, being a touring musician also takes its toll. Uh, so you have you have both sides of the story, and and you've been kind of you know uh, you know uh, it, having both experiences at once. Uh, I, I I would say so. How have you been dealing with this push? And the lifestyle is there, definitely a bit of a contradiction of terms as far as how we live out there on the road. It's really hard. Um, but one thing I can tell you, and the blessing of this sort of whole being able to stay at home for a year was coming to terms with uh, my relationship with different substances, namely alcohol, because um, it's such a huge part of life on the road. You're throwing a free bottle every day. So, you know, I would use that. I realize now I would use that to numb myself. I would use that to escape because I was sad about being away from my loved ones. And it, the tour bus in your bunk can be a very lonely place. And it's funny because it's not something that is talked about very much because no one wants to hear someone who's in a touring band dealing with these issues because most people like shut up you've got a dream job just deal with it what are you talking about go write some music that's usually <laughs> what i get from people um so you know prior to this you know pandemic i was starting to understand that um but being home for a year and being still and being out of that chaos of that life has been so eye-opening for me and I actually was having a discussion recently with another lead singer of a band. It was the same thing. We both just cut way back on alcohol and started to sort of deal with our own thoughts soberly and getting into an exercise routine. You know, again, touching back on lifestyle, catching up with saying you're not okay and then doing something about it. Uh, and I know for sure when I get back on the road, it's definitely maybe harder to do what I'm doing now. I would say right now where I am, I'm in the best spot I've ever been mentally in my entire life, despite the craziness of the world. Uh, and it's just a byproduct of slowing down and sort of being more present and appreciative and embracing family and these things that I just never really had time for. Uh, but I know for sure the road when it brings me back in is going to be a whole other set of challenges because that lifestyle is hard. Even if you don't have um, pre-existing conditions and you start to tour, you're going to eventually develop some because it's it's a tough life to live, uh, at least mentally, you know, and physically, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to navigate. And I'm fortunate enough to be surrounded by people who are fairly understanding of, you know, cause I'm outspoken on the bus. Like I, when I'm not okay, I say it, I'll come to the front lounge with tears in my eyes and I'll be able to talk to somebody so they're, they're they know me enough to know that when I'm not okay, I got to talk. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I have that thankfully on the road, but it's interesting. It is interesting. And, uh, you know, I think it really echoes something um, that, uh, uh, Kate, if I could turn to you, I mean, just looking at the background, you know, and some of the kind of statements about heavy metal therapy that I've learned about, um, I think one of the most resonant ones there, and I think it really echoes what Jesse's been saying, is that uh, uh, sharing stories is powerful. You know, um, you know the, it's, it's not just um, validating, it's important for other people to kind of hear people sharing those stories and their experiences and to know perhaps that they're not alone. So, so tell us a little bit about your work with heavy metal therapy, um, how it came about and, and the kind of response it's had. Uh, yeah, so um, I am a psychologist by trade, a clinical psychologist, um, and I work in England in the National Health Service, um, most of the time with sort of young adults, really, um, who are perhaps experiencing mental health problems for the first for the first time. Um, I'm also a metalhead and uh, have always personally found heavy metal to be very helpful to my well-being. Over time, you know, met quite a few clients for whom that seemed to be the case, talked to some of my friends for whom that seemed to be the case. And um, I've worked a lot in the hearing voices movement where they really have this belief about uh, peer support and the sharing of stories. So that's kind of where that, that idea um, came from for me. It's not where that idea originated. Um, so really, we just sort of thought about, wouldn't it be great to have a collection of perspectives from fans of heavy metal about the well-being benefits of extreme music. That was where we sort of started. Um, and really, we we're just going to put it on social media to begin. Uh, and I, I think initially thought that it would be a fairly niche interest area. Um, but in fact, it obviously resonated with a lot of people, um, in an, perhaps unexpected to me, but um, maybe not, maybe not to... to um, some of the other people that got that got involved. So people started submitting stories from all over the world. Um, we started to build a bit of a community as well. So um, we do things like we might build playlists together or, you know, share um, little bits of music that have really um, impacted on people. Um, and it's just sort of grown from, grown from there, really. I think as a psychologist, I'm a bit interested in research as well. So I've started thinking about some of that stuff like the theory behind it if that makes sense but it didn't come from that place it came from a place of um people who like metal sharing stories with each other about well-being really mm. i mean it's, it's it's fascinating stuff because of course i mean it, it's not just any you know community or, or area you know i mean it's like what are the qualities of metal music and its community um, that are both advantageous and disadvantageous i mean i you know you could probably tell from the gray i am of an age you know, uh, and, um, you know, certainly I could imagine that there are some benefits and that there's definitely community, but also perhaps some disadvantages as well, you know, particularly where metal for many people is synonymous with this uh, old idea of masculinity um, about internalizing things, about, you know, not talking about them. On a scale of one to 10, how damaging are those ideas? And is that one of the first obstacles in this area is getting people to open up in a way that perhaps they're not accustomed to? Oh, I don't know if I could say it on, on not to 10. I've never been asked that. It's interesting. Um, I think I, I am very cautious not to um, give the impression that I'm saying that heavy metal will save the world or that, you know, it's it's like universally amazing. I do think there are some negative and inaccurate stereotypes about people who like, who like heavy metal. And I guess one of them might be around um, this idea that it could promote negative... Uh, behaviors or feelings and things like that whereas in fact um it seems to be almost the opposite of that that it just seems to sort of um help people to maybe release difficult feelings or process difficult feelings um so i do think that there's a bit of a um a bit of a pr sort of job around thinking about uh, some of the good things about the about the metal community and the community aspect in particular seems to be something that people people talk about um, but yeah, equally, we don't want to be saying that it's it's perfect, and we know that there are we know that there are issues. And I think I notice, and this is just a personal thing because people share things with with me on the side, that um, some of the kind of older um, heavy metal tracks that talk about mental health um, 
almost kind of there's a bit of a caricature thing about it like you know they might talk about insanity or have somebody in a straight jacket or you know something something like that some of those really kind of um yeah old school kind of stereotype thing and yet as I've seen it moves through I think some of the particular newer metalcore bands for example they seem to talk a lot more about things like vulnerability and like particularly male vulnerability actually that seems to be be much more of a more of a theme so I feel as if it, it's changed over time I can't prove that but that's just my perspective from people sharing different things on the site I would back uh, Jesse, to on, on that yeah sorry I wanted to ask you about your lyrics speaking of positivity does this resonate yeah, 100%. And, uh, you know, I've been around long enough to see the shift. I really have. And she's very accurate in saying that the the younger bands came out of a more emotional place. You know, I know a lot of those guys. We've taken a lot of those guys on tour and I've seen it. It's it's really fascinating because I think you had in the music, you had a shift. You know, when Killswitch first came on the scene, there was still quite a bit of masculinity, like posturing and sort of that was still still existing for sure and you got a lot of that from new york hardcore especially here in the northeast it's just a mix in a storm of combating that sort of tough guy thing into having it be okay with you know writing a song that people perceive to be an emotional thing like my last serenade that was a gateway song to a lot of people and when i meet young bands they point to stuff like that or end of heartache you know kills just catalog went from being sort of an introspective thing to a more emotional thing to you know, to eventually morphing into like talking about mental health issues. So a lot of these young guys grew up on this music and were a part of that shift. We're, we're kids when it, we were talking about this stuff. So you see a lot of the younger bands who are, it's almost like being a vulnerable male is a, is a thing. It's like, a, it's something that's not just, not just a normal thing, but people almost praise it. Like it's good to see someone on camera, on social media, being an emotional person and I love that. And people still kind of joke about it, but it's spread to the point where it's not, it's almost the norm for that particular genre of music. And I, I love that. I think it's great. It empowers people. It allows them to be more comfortable showing, you know, different sides of their personality. It's allowed people who um, are homosexual to feel more comfortable. Uh, it's allowed people who are transgender. I have fans who are transgender who are more comfortable saying that and being in a crowd of people. And I think what really opened my eyes was taking time with people outside of the bus after the show, because we usually have a decent crowd that will crowd around the bus. So taking that time after the show to sit and stand in that circle of people for a half hour to an hour. And I usually do it until every single person has had their say. I let them talk um, if I have the time. And the vast majority of that has been positive. I hear and see just the interactions with people being polite, letting someone go first. If someone's crying or having a hard time, the other people will be compassionate to it. I've seen so much camaraderie over the years and it's, it's only getting better. And it does have to do with the lyrics, but it also has to do with the way that the band is, you know, you meet anyone in kill switch, even the grumpy guys, we're nice guys. We're, we're not assholes. Uh, and I think it may vary from crowd to crowd, but the younger generation is a lot more open and a lot more accepting and a lot more willing to talk about this stuff. And I think it took bands being brave enough to sort of wear their heart on their sleeve when it wasn't cool. And I was definitely one of those people. And you know, the backlash I got was, was minor compared to what we've been able to accomplish by allowing people to feel more safe and to be more comfortable talking about it. So yeah, the younger generations is definitely carrying the torch and I'm, I'm proud to see that. It's awesome. I fully fully echo that sentiment and, and I, I, there's a word that's come up you know once or twice um and i think rightly so and um you know kate turning to you um it, it, the word is safe you know how much of this is really just about creating a safe space for people to talk about what's going on with them i mean so much of what i've read about heavy metal therapy it's about peer support it's not just going in to speak with specialists or whatever else it's just that sense of what Jesse is talking about is the reaction that people have when someone is visible and talking about these issues and receptive to people talking to them about their own as well. How much of it really is just about that safe space? I think probably quite a lot. Um, but I do think there is something about um, alternative communities 
particularly the metal community that um sometimes helps people to identify with something so um i've you know certainly spoken to people who've said that um they were only interested in coming to something or talking about something because it was to do with heavy metal um so it feels like for some people that really gives them the language and the um the, the, the sense that it's okay to sort of come and come and talk about that stuff um so, so it feels to me that, that there is something important about us um you know talking and reaching people who identify as part of that community if that makes sense and that is often I think a hook um other than just saying you know we can just set up um support groups or you know peer, peer support groups or whatever it is um a lot of people do seem to be um saying that they they feel say almost safer as part of that community because there are I suppose some unwritten rules in terms of what um what's acceptable and I think there's Again, not saying perfect, but I think, um, for example, in the research, they, t they talk a lot about um, this idea that um, metal identity uh, is, is really important and can actually be quite protective, particularly for like um, vulnerable young kids who feel maybe different or perhaps being bullied or targeted in some way. Um, there's something about the chosen difference. Um, Paula Rowe talks a lot about this in her research, um, that, that um, that's protective, it's socially protective um be, versus i don't know being a victim or something like that of bullying was about the chosen difference and i do think that that's something that's important in terms of making safe spaces for people to talk about things um because i think that that you know that identity is helpful i think the language is helpful in terms of um lyrics and things that people can relate to as well um often we find that if there's a song or something that is that can scaffold a conversation you know it gives a focus for something a, a conversation um, and I can't tell you how many people I've worked with in my own kind of clinical work um, who can't have a one to one conversation with you, but you ask them what kind of music they like or, you know, what kind of lyrics they're interested in. And you find out loads about them because it's a safer way to talk about it. It feels less, um, less vulnerable. Can I um, ask about the, the pandemic? And this is a question to both of you. Um, Katie, obviously, a lot of your work was already online because of the website and and uh, you know Facebook etc. But of course now you know uh, people have no other way uh, to 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 communicate with with another human being. I mean it's very rare that you know people are able to meet face to face. And Jesse, you know this is now the opposite of what I was talking about earlier with the touring being out there. Now a lot of musicians who are used to being out there are practically grounded at home. Um, so can you also talk about how that has affected you and how you're dealing with it? So, um, yeah, so Katie, um, again, how has the pandemic affected your work? Um, so there's, there's a few things. I think the first one or the biggest one has been that a lot of people find massive therapeutic value in attending gigs or going to concerts or um even going to your local rock club or you know whatever whatever it is that you know there's a real sort of gap then in in the community and that feels like that's a really important thing that's missing for a lot for a lot of people um so we really tried to um think about ways that we could perhaps be a little bit more interactive because when we started i always say that we're more like a resource library than we are a support group um so you know we're kind of more of a collection of, of resources really um but we did try to think about how we might be a bit more interactive and you know we did a few webinars and places for people to talk really because we recognized that the isolation seemed to be a big a big big factor um and the other thing is that a lot of people who maybe haven't struggled before have started to struggle um and people who had pre-existing problems maybe those problems are now a bit worse yes. um so there's, there's a big big demand i guess uh, in the bit, uh, to sort of deal with which i see in my day job but also you know on, on the site that yeah it's a lot and I think um it's going to be coming out of it is, is going to be hard <laughs> you know that's where the real work that's where, where the real stuff is I think yeah <laughs> um you know I've got my own journey but I also like she just said I've, I know people that didn't think they had issues that now have issues um and I think I'll speak on that first because I think that's huge um you know, especially when you're talking from a musician standpoint, when you have a life on the road, that particular lifestyle keeps you going. 
you have shows to look forward to, you have interviews to look forward to, you have people to see in every city. It's a very exciting, very forward moving thing that gives you sort of a schedule. You know, as, as much as it's an abnormal lifestyle, there are things that you cling to when you've been doing it for years and years and years. And when that's taken away from you, uh, I find that close friends of mine have dealt with a real sense of purpose lost. They don't, ha they don't feel like they have a purpose. Uh, the party has stopped for some people too. So you take all those elements away and you're forced to sit with yourself without any distractions, you know, and you can binge watch shows all you want and try to, to run and run. But eventually this year it's caught up with a lot of people. And uh, a few of my friends are, are in therapy that had never grown men, not, in, not never like some guys that I know that were like bold faced. I'm fine. Nothing's bothering me are like having mental issues and, dealing with anxiety, dealing with attention deficit disorder, all these things that they did have but didn't recognize it because either the drinking or the drugs or the lifestyle masked it or they were able to push it to the side. So it's come to a sort of a full halt. And I think that that's a blessing in disguise for some people. And then from my personal experience, uh, for me, I've been able to work on myself a lot because I did go through a phase of like, being relieved to be home because I've been touring so much or having that rest. I mean, like, ah, oh, finally get a break. This is actually, you know, tragedy aside for me personally, at first it was like a breath of fresh air to stay home. And then you go through a cycle where it's like, oh, now my main thing that gives me purpose and makes me feel alive and people tell me that I'm good, I'm getting the applause, all that high, that feeling that you get from life on the road is gone. And I went through a pretty low point. And I was drinking a lot and I was sort of not getting out of bed and watching shows like stuff I would never do because uh, I'm usually a fairly active, positive person. Then coming out of that was like legitimately one of the most awakening moments of my life when I did put alcohol aside, when I did put all the things aside and I just, well, who am I and what's going on with me? I had to really come to terms with a lot of stuff and I don't think it would have happened otherwise. Uh, as hard as this pandemic has been for many reasons, the one blessing I've seen through it is people have, are forced to sort of face down themselves and really turn inward and through the help of loved ones. And then Zoom being an amazing tool to do like band meetings or uh, fan meetings. I did one the other day and I was literally reduced to tears seeing people's faces and hearing their testimony about the, the music and finally reconnecting to that little bit of feeling you get when you perform live, you realize how powerful that is. And, and she's right. Like people are missing that interaction so much because it was just something we took for granted. And I think because of that, it's going to help us rethink how special live concerts are and that social interaction and that community that we've developed over years. So, you know, as with any situation as a human, you have to learn how to thrive and push through and survive it. So I think coming out of this, it's going to be incredible. It's going to be difficult. And some people are probably going to lose their minds for a little while when, when things get sort of get back to a social environment. But I'm one of those people that I believe everything is happening for a reason and you have to sort of take it one step at a time. So there's good things and bad things, but I've been trying my best to focus on the positive things and support my friends who are going through these issues and the fans. It's, just, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in and it's going to be a lot to unpack when this thing starts to change into a more social environment, but I welcome it. I think it's going to be great. I think very well said. And uh, I think, yeah, we all welcome it. And um, I think that these conversations, I fully agree, are so important that, you know, um, uh, because one of the things that I've seen appear more and more, and I guess this is just a, a, a feeling that I get. Um, I'd like to ask this of both of you. How important is, uh, physical well-being and physical health to mental health and so on. Because, you know, I, I see so many people talking about the two things interchangeably. I mean, Jesse, starting with you, I mean, you talked about that a little bit and so on. I mean, how important is the physical routine to, I guess, you know, just, you know, finding balance in, in other sorts of areas and how important has it been to you? Massive, massive. I'd say over anything um, that has been huge. And anytime I talk to people who are having a hard time, I just say, you know, a list of things. You don't even have to go crazy. Just go out for a nice long walk. Go get some fresh air. And if you're in a weird situation in the city, go to a park 
or if you have a treadmill, like I tell people to sweat, get out and sweat, get your blood going because the body will give you uh, endorphins. You'll feel a difference. It's not just about the, the physical, like how you're going to look, which is usually a lot of people associate exercise with trying to work out and, and all this stuff that I don't give a shit about. Um, the, the mental benefits that you get from just moving and exercising and getting in a routine. Uh, my friend, uh, Matt, who's a dear friend of mine, I do a podcast with um, called Stoke the Fire. Him and I have talked a lot about this where he started to do 10 kilometers every single day. And he went from being depressed to, to being not only in a better headspace, but getting more done, being more compassionate, having more headspace for his work. Uh, and I would say the same thing for me, like, I'm fortunate enough to live out in the mountains where I don't have to see my neighbors. I can go into the woods and not see a single person. So it's okay for me. And I feel free there. I feel liberated and I'm able to get my blood going. And I might even put a playlist on of some good music that, you know, a band called Catatonia I've been obsessed with. I just recently discovered them. So I've been listening to binging all their records and going out in the woods and sort of living in this fan world. But all that has just really made me rediscover a lot of who I am. And, and because of, getting outside and getting the blood going has made me happy and, and I'm able to be more productive. It's just as it's, you can't go wrong with getting physical activity in. you can't, it's, it's a win-win situation. So I am always telling people who are struggling, get out and sweat, get your blood going. Trust me, find something that you don't mind doing. You don't have to go to the gym and pump iron and stare in a mirror. You can go for a long nature walk with your favorite album on. That'll do wonders for you. One of the things that I always um, think about when I think about like physical exercise and um, physical well-being is that um, the research suggests that um, if you do regular exercise, that is as effective as taking antidepressants in terms of like outcome for like low mood, for example. Um, so it's probably really under um, underused or, or misunderstood as a um, in terms of how powerful it can it can be. Um, it's worked a lot for me. I, you know, I like um, doing weights and things like that. That, that for me is a, is the thing. Um, and just on a personal level, I could never really get into exercise until I completely divorced it from the idea of how I looked and weight and those kinds of those kinds of things. Because um, I actually probably missed out on a good 10, 15 years of, of what could have been much better mental health <laughs> by not realizing that and you know by sticking those things things together but yeah it is it is hugely uh, hugely helpful um if you can not everybody can you know and I know that obviously there are people with physical challenges or in the lockdown you know if you live in a block of flats it might be very very difficult to do something something like that um so yeah just to sort of say that mm. um and of course you know just in, in metal there's um I think there's a great thing about the physicality of things like mosh pits and you know getting in there and getting that anger out and um yeah, that they can be big, uh, big outlets. I think for people, hmm. isn't it? Isn't it funny? Uh, yeah. Please go ahead, Lena. I'm, I'm just, I'm just imagining, you know, a new exercise trend. You know how you have metal yoga and doom yoga. I'm thinking, why not, you know, um, mosh pits instead of aerobics, for example. <laughs> Living room mosh pits. Well, why not? <laughs> Look, you heard it here first. I mean, look, it, <laughs> it, it, honestly, I'm in. I am fully in. I love I it. Am, you know, I'm going to do that you know, tonight now. <laughs> all right. Done. All right. I, uh, well, look, but, but this is the thing, though, isn't it? You know, I mean, I, I think that um, long before there was this internal dialogue, I think, you know, within this, you know, community of just, you know, like-minded fans and musicians and so on, um, the amount of people just saying, gosh, I feel great, you know, just the catharsis that comes from a show. You know, just like a sweaty, disgusting, cramped, you know, little gig, like where you just basically, you you walk in and out of it. And Jesse, I can't imagine what it's like from your perspective. But man, oh man, I mean, that is a rush, you know. But there's also an extreme physicality to it all. And there is also catharsis, you know, um, the same way that people feel, I think, catharsis by the lyrics, by turning the music up, obviously, without damaging your hearing. Um, you know, protect those ears, everybody. But, um, you know, doing, um, I guess, a bit of time as a, you know, music journalist and so on. I mean, the one thing that you see over and over again, um, when you stand back from things and you witness this scene, you're not just experiencing it, is the amount of happy faces, the amount of people that feel almost as if they've come out of something akin to a workout, akin to a spiritual experience, 
um, and full of endorphins, there is something really transformative about that. And it's been around for a long time. Only now we can kind of pinpoint it all. Wow, you know, it is literally just the brain manufacturing chemicals because people walk out of it feeling great because we are physical beings. And I think that's one of the things that's just so very interesting. But I do want to go back to something that I think is, um, you know, kind of like an important thing. I think, Kate, as you talked about, there are some areas of, you know, the culture of this music that um, at times I worry is holding people, you know, back, you know, because of, you know, the, um, the sort of like the, uh, the way that talking about things to some implies some kind of weakness, not strength or whatever else. How do we combat that? How do we get people to stop being that way and open up and talk about these things? And, and where do we direct people, you know, when they feel that they need help and they obviously do and so on? What is the chain of action that we should all learn to undertake? The same way as if you see a building on fire, you know exactly what to do and who to call. What do we do in these situations and what do people have to get accustomed to doing as automatically? At heavy metal therapy, we always say that, um, you know, we're not a replacement for services, uh, mental health services. And, um, you know, we hope to be something that might be useful that could sit alongside that, whether you're, you're using services or, or not. Um, I guess it's probably different in, in different um, uh, countries, for sure. But certainly in, in, in the UK, if you feel that you need more specific support, like you want, you feel like you need some help from perhaps mental health services, the usual route is through is through like your GP to go and see go and see your doctor. Um, there are various helplines as well that that, um, that can kind of key you into um, services, or that you can you know speak to if you want to if you want to talk to somebody about how you how you're feeling. Um, and even things like text message ones, there's quite a good one in the UK called Shout, which is really good because you can text people. And I think for a lot of younger people, that's um, that's sometimes maybe easier than um, than perhaps talking on talking on the phone and things things like that. Um, so yeah, I think there's 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 a separation for me between sort of um, stuff we can do in the community, stuff that is kind of the you know the peer support stuff, and then um, services which sort of sit do sit separately I think and they can run together um, but we certainly wouldn't want to be saying that um, the work that we're doing here is, is like a replacement for that um, you know that's a separate that is a separate thing. Good point well I, I suppose yeah I guess that's one of those things it's like I, I think until um, you know someone clutches at the chest and they can't breathe people know exactly what to do in this situation however it's not always completely obvious and I guess that's the thing is I opened the conversation with the thought about destigmatization, um, you know, because I think that perhaps that's the greatest hurdle, um, you know, in in much of this is getting people to kind of, I guess, get over it, you know, and feel confident in talking about these things and and not so vulnerable. I mean, um, Jesse, I mean, in, in the time since you've begun giving interviews and really kind of like, I think having so much influence over this dialogue internally, you know, within the community and so on, have you seen real change in, in the way that people talk about things? I mean, it sounds like you've had quite the response in people approaching you and so on, because you seem to become, I guess, you know, uh, uh, for many, uh, a beacon and someone who kind of like, you know, embodies this confidence in confronting these things. Yeah. Um... Yeah, I think that confidence is definitely something I've worked on, though, because I'm still, you know, very much affected by my own sort of uh, way of thinking. And, you know, I have a list of issues that I have that I combat daily um, and imposter syndrome and anxiety and all these things that I constantly combat. But um, I just think through talking about things, through meeting people, through learning, through therapy, through reading about things, just caring about the subject enough, not just for myself, but knowing that people are looking at me, that eyes are on me and people do ask me for advice. Um, I'm just, I can't ignore it. I, I feel a sense of responsibility. And because of that, it's really helped me a lot in my own life. So the more I've gained, the more I'm just trying to give back. And I'm also really careful to tell people, especially people who are suicidal, which I've dealt with a few of those fans before, I'm the first to say, look, I'm not a professional. I'm not a therapist. I'm just like you. I'm learning. And I've only gotten to where I've gotten because I've put in the work and I've, I've tried to figure this out because I, at a certain point, I just got so tired of being depressed. I got, I was, I was angry about it. I started to get angry about my own mental health. And that's when I just decided to, to flip it and to start caring on a whole other level. And because of that, it's changed my life. And 
my confidence now comes from I just don't care what people think about me anymore. I really don't. Because the people who are poking at me and making fun of me, it's because of their insecurities. It's, I mean, when you get to that moment when you realize it's not about you anymore, the people who are poking fun at you or, or, or you know, that sort of group of people who are not willing to talk about it, those are the people who are afraid. And you can actually see their fear. You can see that as sort of a something they need to work on. And I actually feel bad for people, you know, when they reach out, because some people will re go out of their way to message me to sort of pick at me and make fun of me or like talk shit. And I, I chuckle now where when I was younger, I would, be like, ah, you don't understand, I would get really worked up. And the only person getting affected by that is me. So you, you start to learn that this war, this battle that we all go through, the only way you're going to benefit from it is you start to take control of it. Uh, and part of that, you know, using the word control loose because it's a mental disorder. You can't really have a hold on it, but there's a lot you can do to like get better at coping with it and dealing with it. So because of that dialogue, and it's something I talk about frequently, especially now I'm like weekly, I'm talking about this. And the more I talk and the more and just, just yesterday, somebody said two sentences to me that really just, I literally had to hold back tears. It just punched me in the face. And it's like, something I've been wrestling with for years, someone just said it and it was just there for me and it stunned me. But moments like that only happen if you're open and if you're asking for help and if you're talking about it, you know, that's the first step is, is sort of admitting, talking, and then everything else just starts to happen. You just have to be open to it. So I tell people all the time who are coming at me or asking what the answer is. And I'll tell you, I don't have the answer. If this is what I've experienced and here's the tools you can utilize. And having a good therapist is incredible. It's amazing. You have to find the right one, though. I always tell people that, too. Don't just settle for one therapist, because I always hear people say, I tried therapy. It sucked. It doesn't work for me. I'm like, well, how many people did you go see? This one person. I'm like, that's ridiculous. You have to find somebody who, who gels with you. And once you find that person, and I had that person, she changed everything. She, she took issues that were so messy in my head and just as clear as day, like the snap of a finger, it was like, I see it completely different now because this woman that I dealt with 20 years of experience, 20 years of studying, 20 years of caring and making this their passion. So you've got to like realize the resources that you have. You're not in it alone. That's a big thing. I tell a lot of people, you're not alone. There are so many of us, you know, the song I am broken too. this song right here has changed the landscape for me. And it's, it's allowed a dialogue of people to realize that they're not alone. And that's the biggest thing I would say. Utilize the people that are around you because you're not alone. Because there are amazing, amazing people that are willing to help and hear you out and care. And, and will make you feel safe talking about it. And that's everything. That's everything. And if, I, if I may just here add something that I think is important to note, which is that our guests today, Jesse and Katie, you are from the US and the UK, respectively. A lot of our listeners, uh, fans who watch the World Metal Congress, metal fans around the world come from all kinds of countries where this conversation we're having right now is still regarded taboo, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't have access to the resources that Katie just mentioned or the uh, access to therapists, for example, like the one uh, you just talked about, Jesse. And in a way, I think this pandemic, by forcing everybody in a way to just go online, has opened up opportunities for these people to reach out to those beyond their borders. Because if they can't get the support in their own countries, at the very least, they can feel they are part of a global community that cares and that can listen. And although their own societies may not necessarily be understanding and accepting yet, I think that you know there is something positive that is that is happening in the world that I think we should all try to also um, work with. Um, so, if I may, Jesse, just um, ask you, just you know, um, what would you tell these musicians or fans in places you know that are remote? Uh, you just said you are not alone. Um, what would you say to them in a, in a kind of more concrete way regarding coping, coping tips that you learned yourself 
uh, that worked for you. Of course, everyone's individual, but um, you know, what has worked for you that, that you think, you know, maybe this would be something for, for musicians, especially um, to, to embrace. Yeah. First of all, I commend you for bringing that point because it's so easy to get caught in your own sort of world view of things. And, and clearly there are places in the world where this is definitely a, a, you know, a foreign concept, something that they're not hearing from their peers or their parents or that's spot on. And I've talked to some of those people. I've, I've been able to realize the sort of privilege that we live in in our countries, uh, respectively the UK and the US for our resources and for the destigmatizing of mental uh, health issues. Because yeah, there's in the Middle East, I've got fans I've talked to in the Middle East, I've got fans I've talked to in India, and it's just, it's a whole other world there for sure. Um, so not being alone is definitely a huge one. Um, but you know, that only carries so much weight. Um, like you said, when people are in lockdown, down and they only have the internet to turn to but there are resources on the internet thankfully um but that aside um i think it just goes down back cycling back to the physical stuff but also to the to the mental well-being as far as you know what kind of music you're listening to the lyrics so we're talking about metal you know there are, there's metal that will make you pull you out of your dark place and there's metal that will help you dwell in it i think there's a place for both but i think balance is key so as far as what you're feeding your mind with music, with uh, movies that you're watching, TV shows, books you're reading, people that you have in your inner circle of, of friends, because a lot of people are stuck in toxic situations at home. And that's another aspect of this pandemic that has been detrimental to a lot of people's health. I mean, you could it runs the gamut from abuse to narcissism to all of these people that you are forced to stay around. So that adds a whole other difficult um, element to it. But, you know, I think you have control of the way that you perceive things. You have control of what you're putting into your mind. And then I would even say, this has been huge for me as well, my diet. And uh, granted, this is luxury for some people because not everyone has the resources or finances to eat a certain way. But changing my lifestyle, my diet has been huge. Feeding myself with cleaner foods, lighter foods, having a routine of like healthy stuff, starting my morning off with like ginger tea and going to like smoothies and juices and like this healthy lifestyle has actually affected my brain as well. So getting away from the, you know, the food that actually can make you feel a certain way. So it really runs this whole spectrum of not just physical exercise, not just diet, but also what you're feeding your mind. And I think that's huge. And you talk about lyrics, you talk about um, the intention of a musician and their and the way they're presenting their music and the way that it makes you feel even sonically the sound of music without words completely i have a playlist of music and you can find this on spotify and i've actually made a record i have a th therapeutic music i've created called the way back within and it's all music that i designed to help with anxiety to help with sleep and i put a lot of positive loving intention into this music and I think there's a lot of therapeutic sounds you can do too. Ambient music is beautiful. And, and I've found a lot of help through just playlists and music that are not metal at all. I mean, metal's great. Don't get me wrong. It's great. But balance, when you're getting ready to go to bed, some people can fall asleep to death metal. I used to when I was like 16, but now I like, I like lush piano music. I love these things that are quiet and calm. And the music I've created, I actually... Do it in such a way where it's slower than a, a rapid heart rate. I actually have songs that I designed when I was having anxiety. I'd come in this room with my piano and my equipment and play things that soothed me. And I would record them and put them out. So there's a whole, it's literally just sharpening your 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 arsenal, gaining your, your ammunition to fight this war. And it's not just one thing, it's everything. It's all encompassing. It's holistic, really. Very well said. Um, you know, uh, I, I wondered, uh, you know, to follow on from that and something that Lena mentioned again, you know, just some of these key words, you know, um, is taboo, you know, um, just, you know, just like confronting it, um, you know, uh, sidestepping it, you know, and, and obviously, because we do have a very global audience and so on. I think one of the, you know, the, the, the key ways to challenge taboo is 
changing the way that we talk about things. And Kate, I wondered if you could kind of give us perhaps some guidelines for all of our benefit as well as the people watching as well. I mean, how important and what guidance can you offer in terms of the way that people talk about you know, mental illness and so on? Because I mean, I find the way that it's um, the terminology itself, you know, is obviously sometimes problematic. Um, you know, um, it can create barriers um, to communication and so on. And I wondered if you could offer some advice there, because I, I think that could be really useful for, for all of us, for people that might be tuning in. This is something that's been, you know, debated massively, particularly in sort of like um, medical circles around like how the language that we use for mental, mental health. Um, and, you know, there are some people that don't like the idea of using like diagnoses at all, you know, like talking about even even the word illness sometimes can be um, controversial in some in, in, in some circle. Um, we tend to talk about things on the site in terms of different kinds of experiences. Um, so we might talk about, you know, mood, for example, or trauma, um, hearing voices, you know, we don't necessarily kind of categorise it in, in any way. And, and perhaps in that way, think about um, for a lot of people, there's probably a bit of a continuum. So, um, you know, if you take voices, for example, just because that's my area of uh, interest and, and, and expertise, um, there are many, many people walking around with those experiences who may have never told anybody, might not even be distressed by it, for example. Um, and yet there are some people who have really, I'm quite a fan of the phrase extreme state, really, that, that, that they have very, ex you know, extreme and very intense experiences that are very, that are very distressing. Um, so I think the language that we use is is quite important. And as I say, there's a lot of there is a lot of variation. Um, but just kind of coming back to what you were saying about the concept of things being taboo and difficult to talk about. Um, I do think that it, heavy metal lyrics often reference certain kinds of experiences that are um, not talked about a lot in our society, really. Voices might be one of them. Um, and I think there is something about helping people to turn towards those concepts a little bit, engage with those concepts that's validating in some ways. Um, but also I think, you know, um, does probably reduce the stigma around it. That's very culturally dependent, of course. So there will be some places absolutely right, whereby um, any sort of mental health related things are just not discussed or it's not safe or they're framed in a very different, in a very different way. Um, so I've worked with people, for example, for whom um, it's been much more of a kind of spiritual or religious explanation has been adopted. Whereas I guess in um, maybe our society, we might think of it in a health related um, related thing. Um, and I guess that's the strength of, of the internet and having these resources around that people all over the world can, can access. And I'm um, always uh, honored and, um, you know, delighted when somebody contacts us from you know miles and <laughs> miles away and says, you know, I found I found this and I found something something within it. Even to the extent where occasionally people submit things that um, they say, you're going to have to change my name because it is not safe for me to talk about this in my community. But then they find a space for it, and I think that's really good. That is really good, and uh, you know, inspirational work. I have to say. Well, I mean, I guess this is why we wanted to bring in this topic. I think we all felt like it was hugely important. Uh, but uh, I got to say on behalf of everyone who's watching, everyone at World Metal Congress as well, Jesse and Kate, what an absolute pleasure it's been. And I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you so much for giving us the time. And uh, all of us, I think, uh, a bit of inspiration um, for how perhaps we can change and the ways that we can help, not just ourselves, but others in our community as well. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Honored. Well, Lena, that was a tremendous conversation, stimulating and as ever uh, a necessary one. I wish we had a little more time because it feels like we're really just getting going. But I, I guess the important thing that I take away from that is this is a conversation that has no end, right? This is something that has to be talked about constantly because that's the only way that we can really affect change. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if we did one thing today is help with the destigmatization of this conversation and also as Jesse um, said make people feel that they are not alone they are not alone also in uh, wanting to talk about this we're here to talk about this and hopefully we'll continue this conversation um, one way or another and it's a very important ongoing issue 
for everyone concerned. Indeed, and uh, as we do have a international audience um, connecting, um, we're going to list uh, helplines that are available internationally for people who may be watching from all around the world. We encourage them to go to the website or indeed to seek help and be a part of the change. Lena, as ever, an absolute pleasure to join you and uh, we look forward to the next episode of World Metal Congress. Thank <laughs> you.